I've always said that I don't have hobbies. I have friends. My name is Kate Bowler, and this is Everything Happens. So, look, (laughs) I'm not someone with, I think, what they call um, self-esteem. I'm someone who is externally constituted. I'm an outside-in kind of person slash project. I am almost entirely held up by the people who love me, who remind me who I am, who carry my stories with them, even especially the most embarrassing ones that they will remind me of again and again and again. Today's conversation is dedicated to the many loves that make up our lives, especially that of our friends. And frankly, I don't think friendships get enough hype. What a rare and precious gift to have friends. Friends that troll you. Friends that love you. Friends that want to hear your boring story. Isn't it just a miracle that we get to have people who bear witness to our lives and we get to do that for other people? My guest today is someone who recognizes the great gift of the friends who've walked with her through many seasons of life. All the highs and lows and in-betweens. Dolly Alderton is a writer, journalist, and broadcaster. She is the author of Sunday Times best-selling memoir, Everything I Know About Love. Also, like when I see people reading it, I genuinely stop them and explain to them that the book is good from beginning to end. It also <laughs> became an unbelievably brilliant television show. And her latest runaway best-selling novel, Good Material, is as good and so funny. <laughs> and I feel so lucky to be talking with her today about the great loves that make up a life. Her partners and friends and ourselves. Holy crap, Dolly. I've been so excited. <laughs> about this. Thank you so much for doing this with me. Thank you so much for having me. We've met 10 minutes ago and I can already tell you're an utterly delightful energy. So thank you so much for having me. (laughs) You, in um, one of your books, featured other great Canadian, Margaret Atwood, in describing the feeling of trying to live a story. And she has that gorgeous quote, when you're in the middle of a story, it isn't a story at all, but only a confusion. A dark roaring, a blindness, a wreckage of shattered glass and splintered wood, like a house in a whirlwind, or else a boat crushed by the icebergs or swept over the rapids, and all aboard powerless to stop it. It's only afterwards that it becomes anything like a story. Mm. And when you think about your lives as full of so many loves, I thought maybe that's how we could frame a little bit of our conversation today about great loves that have made up your life yeah I'd love that I love that you picked out that quote because that was um something they don't tell you about when you publish a book is that if you quote anyone the author pays for it stop so I was a 28 year old with like (laughs) no money living in a house share and I'd (laughs) quoted Auden Margaret Atwood (laughs) Morrissey and I tell you, I think Auden was 150 quid to, per, to quote an Auden poem. I was like, fine, that's great. Take it out my check. And then Morrissey, I think, was four and a half grand. And because I quoted a Smith's uh, lyric, him and Johnny Marr had to read the book Start. to approve. And they were like, look, we're just going to warn you. We don't think this is going to be top of Morrissey's pile to read. So I think you've got to lose the quote. <laughs> But Margaret Atwood must have been bargain basement prices. So that's so nice are of her. very affordable. As, as someone, but there's a there's there's a thing I relate to so much in the way that you talk about your life because almost all of our cultural storytelling is about romantic love. But like one of the most beautiful things about my life has been the way it has been structured by the love of friends. Mm. And you you are deeply in love with your friends. Totally. I got. I write an advice column and I wrote one an answer today and the question was from a girl who was 21 and she said she's been best friends with the same person since childhood. They were inseparable. She said she's my person. That's how I describe her. And she's fallen in love and the friend's just gone. And I just felt the pain so acutely when I read this letter. I just remember that feeling so well. And I just like, I so can forgive that we don't realise how important these friendships are until you're kind of into your mid-late 20s. You have to lose a romantic love, I think, or you have to like 
dissolve into a relationship and totally sideline your friends and make that mistake to then come back and realize, God, I can't ever do that again. Because I remember the strange feeling of betrayal the first time a very good friend had a relationship. Betrayal and abandonment. And abandonment is like, this is what so much of what good material was about when I was kind of looking at the nature of heartbreak. Anything that feels at all like abandonment takes you back to a time even before memory, I think. Yeah. Something that's a cellular feeling of being a child, or I don't know, of suddenly feeling I'm not safe, someone's gone. Yes. And every time that that's mirrored again, whether it's in rejection professionally or someone leaving you or a friend kind of stop, stop replying to your texts because they're with their boyfriend, it just takes you to an incredibly unreasonable, frightened place. <laughs> yes, totally. And, and you can feel how unreasonable and utterly reasonable it is. When you describe the framework of how you're allowed to talk about problems, mm. when you describe, I don't know if I'm going to be good at summarizing this, but like when you have a problem and you really want to tell somebody, mm. but it's like you have ch- chips, like you only have oh, so yeah. many you're allowed to put in. Yes, yeah. And I think when it comes to losing a friend, because we have so little cultural language for it, mm. if you feel ghosted slightly ignored even just that's like competitive with somebody else's love Mm. it's really hard to know how many chips you'd have to put in to get the right response totally i think there's always that fear of intensity isn't it it's like it's like the easiest thing to to weaponize against a woman i often found when i was younger whether it was like saying to a friend that i felt like we were drifting because she was spending too much time with her partner or whether it was, I don't know, trying to get a boy to commit to me who was totally non-committal. It always loomed, those words in my head of just like, you don't want this experience to then be repackaged and told by them of like that tall, intense, like mad, bug-eyed girl that just was shouting at me about her feelings or, you know. It's like so, that fear still looms so large for me all the time. Everything you're describing, also, I'm not quite as tall, but I'm medium, pretty <laughs> tall. That sounds so real to me. Yeah. Because my first, I think my first love, love was my friend Chelsea. And you have a Farley. Mm. And reading about your Farley reminded me of my, I met Chelsea when I was 10, in like mm. a judo camp. She just kept being there in all the weird stages. And then when I look back and I try to explain why, there's some version of, well, when I moved away for the first time, she made me a scavenger hunt, and I had to run around this park in the rain collecting letters. And then when oh. I put them all together, they spelled conjunctivitis. <laughs> Don't know why. Oh, my God. Teenage girls are so weird. I love them so much. <laughs> she gets me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you love me and you know me. <laughs> yeah, it's so strange that, like, I'm actually writing about teenage girls at the moment. Yeah. Me and my friend Caroline, we thinking about this project which is about two teenage girls that are really intense with each other and that feeling of like we have a language and a set of cultural references that unfortunately the rest of the world is too dumb to understand like it's so potent that bond between two teenage girls (laughs) of just like this weariness that no one else quite gets it other than you two it's like you never quite have that kinship ever again with anyone, I think. There's like a sugar buzz high feeling yes. all the time. Yes, that's exactly what it is. But that's something that I think is so magic about female friendship. That I'm, I think boys have it who grew up together a bit, but I think women have it. Where it's like, if you've known a woman since you were a teenager, you have access to an eternal girlhood. Like the other day, a few weeks ago, uh, me and all my closest friends and we all have known each other since we were teenagers we went away for the weekend and it was ostensibly for very grown-up reasons we were all stressed in our own very grown-up ways and we all just were like let's just get away for a weekend and we were all kind of talking about very grown-up things and there's sometimes you just like zoom out and you can't believe that you and your friends are like yeah talking about these proper actual fucking real life problems when you've had so many years of not um Or prop, not problem, pressures. Anyway, on the last night at this hotel, we, it just went like rabid. We just, I don't know what happened. We went to this lovely restaurant and we got in the taxi back to the hotel 
And it was like screaming and <laughs> laughing, karaoke. The taxi driver just looked like dead behind the eyes, this poor man. And then we got back to the hotel and it was like loads and loads of cocktails. I insisted everyone took their clothes off. We were singing um, to Sean Paul, jumping up and down on the bed. We thought the bed broke. And then we got a call from the hotel manager being like, look, there have been some complaints. You have to stop. And I was just like, what the hell? I'm 35. How the hell has this happened? It was just like... I I think I could be doing this when I'm 65. Yeah, and it's yeah. not, I just think it's so magic. It's like getting in a time machine. Yes. Yes. Oh, man, that's so good. Eternal girlhood. Because the feeling of witness only works if they've been a witness mm. to a lot of stuff. But it's that, it's the feeling always. Like, they give you, they give you like a little sentence. They give you a little clue. Mm. And then... I don't know. And then you just kind of keep building on almost the same. It's like, it feels like building on the same joke forever. You totally it is that. And actually, like that long, long history, I think I'm so, yeah, I'm now 35. I'm really feeling the benefit and the value of all of that history and that. And it is hard work as well, friendship sometimes, but how much that has accumulated to be something that is incomparable to anything else in my life. When my first book got published, it was an amazing time and it was a very stressful time because in the year, the couple of years afterwards, I hadn't been at all prepared for how enormous it was going to be. And it was very exciting and it changed my life in every single way. But it was also incredibly exposing and destabilizing. I didn't realize I would be perceived by so many people. <laughs> I think the perception of me rather than just the ingesting of a story, I hadn't quite. Totally. You the know, feeling like. Oh, you're going to read this. Yeah. That never and occurs have, to and me. And have thoughts about me. Like, that's what I hadn't... You quite... came to conclusions, but you don't know me? Yeah. That's, that's weird. The, but that's like, I remember being a bit like that after the memoir came out, being like, you know, everyone just thinks they know me. And it's like, I basically asked people to spend £12 to sit and read the entire story of my life. And if they don't have a conclusion on me that is exactly fitting with what I think about myself and my choices, then I'm going to get angry that they don't know me. But anyway, as you can tell, it was like quite a tangled up time a couple of years after I was telling about love with one of my friends Belle she's she we've lived we lived together for years and years and years in our 20s she's was one of the first people I met at university we've known each other since we were 18 and I remember saying to her in a low moment I'd had some criticism for something and I was feeling like a backlash with something and I remember saying like I feel like I don't really deserve any of this success I feel like kind of fraudulent and my I have had very bad anxiety those couple of years I wasn't sleeping very well and and she said I'm not going to let you do this because I have been with you for the whole time. She's like, I was with you when we lived in Camden and you had an office job and you would come back home and you would sit at your laptop and write and eat your dinner in front of your laptop. I was with you when you first started drafting this when you were 25 and our living room was covered in post-its. I was with you when we were 18 at uni and you were like writing plays and writing for the school manager she was like y you can tell whatever story you want to yourself but I was a witness to what happened so whenever you need to be told that this is absolutely everything that you deserve and was always going to be what happened to you I'm here to tell you because I've been here the whole time and it just meant so much to me it was amazing and it's like I can't say that to myself for yes. whatever reason yeah but I'll let you say that yes Sometimes I feel like that's 20% of my brain, the things that I can't possibly say about myself. And that's a big percentage. That's a solid yeah. one out of five. Yeah, totally. Of the things where, and, and I'll forget it so fast, that just that feeling of being mirrored back with love. I'm like, oh, there it is again. Mm. Right, right, right. Yeah. And you wouldn't want to repeat it over and over again to a stranger. No, no. But when they know, they kind of even just like, oh. Yeah. And um, it sounds like the both extremes are the absolutely necessary parts. Like, especially when we have a wonderful thing happen, mm. we we need them to say, I know we feel uncomfortable about the word deserve, but you do deserve this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know your temptation is actually to feel bad. It feels strange sometimes to feel wonderful. Let yourself be glad. Yeah. You know, all yeah. that spectrum. And then the horrible sub-basement of the sub-basement, which is... You are not the bad thing. I'm so mm. sorry this happened to you. Mm. Things will change. I know this feels permanent. But like that shifting feeling of the the witness means, I don't know, it kind of takes the knife's edge off both the very bad and the very good. Totally. 
And like my friend Caroline, whenever she's having a freak out or I'm having a freak out and you're having these big intrusive thoughts, she said that when I describe it to her, mm -hmm. it's like um, I think there's a ghost in my house. Uh -huh. And she, and she, I was like, oh, that's how I feel about you. And it's like, I know Caroline doesn't have a ghost in their house. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, when someone's like, they think they have a ghost in their house. It's like, no, you don't. Like, you know, the reality is everything's fine. But you so understand when it's your house, you're like, yeah. it's definitely a ghost. Yeah. And that's, I think, such. So now we really have this way of being like, she'll be talking to me about something that's like really worrying her, that's crazy that she's invented. And I'll just be like, I'm going to validate this because I know it's real for you. Yeah. But I know there's no ghosts. <laughs> That's know. so good. <laughs> I don't know your house is fine, actually. Because... I know your house. I've opened every yeah, door. Yeah. And yeah. that was actually a really, really useful analogy that we still use. I really like that. It also helps me because Chelsea is desperately afraid of the supernatural. Is she? I do find that the more liberal someone becomes, this is my theological theory about denominations, is sometimes the more liberal someone comes, <laughs> they don't mean to, but they accidentally are like, well, I'm not really sure then what I believe, so I definitely accidentally have to believe in ghosts. We're going to be right back after a break to hear from our sponsors. Don't go anywhere. I wanted to ask you, too, about your parents, because they have one of those deeply annoying loving yeah. relationships yeah. in which they enjoy each other's company and stare into each other's eyes yes. at times what do you yeah. think you learned about love from being their kid it's been such a double-edged sword that love story it's so amazing in so many ways it's obviously very stable which is lovely and i understand that most people don't have that so i know what a privilege that is and I think it allows you to dare to dream for something quite grand from love that I think you get to an age where a lot of people I know became very pragmatic about love, which I also think is totally fine. But pragmatism has never really factored in for me with my choices of romance ever. But I like that there's a sense of grandeur for me in what love is and yeah. what who you can become when you love someone and what you can give to them and what you can create together. I feel very romantic about that because of my mum and dad. Yeah. I also think it has made me have an almost impossible standard for yeah. what I think love should be. I think it's fed into my fantasism, which is not a great, even though that's how I make my money and pay my mortgage, it's not a great part of my, it's a weakness in my personality, I think, is, is my resistance to live in reality. And my parents in their I'm say this as lovingly as possible in their love for each other and their their love of the story of them they have definitely created um a very intricate m m bubble and myth around them about their love for each other and um I don't know if that's been hugely helpful for me um, <laughs> I totally hear you <laughs> you know I what I mean I people like that where they're like and that's how it was always going to be. Yeah. You're like, oh, I don't feel like everyone, anyone dropped that anvil into yeah. my life. Yeah. I guess I just have to wait for the anvil to hit me. Yeah. 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 It's that's such a good way of putting it. It's like, I mean, the other good thing that it has made me realize is my parents are so like a rom com. Like they're so um, cinematically structured, that, yep. their <laughs> relationship, because they both met. My mom was in her early 30s, my dad's in his early 40s. They'd both been kind of war-torn from love in various ways. They both hated each other when they first met each other. And they are both completely incompatible. My mum is extremely left-wing. My dad is extremely right. Well, not extremely, but he's right-wing. Yeah. I'm so... I was always so ready to be totally surprised, I think, by yes. who I could fall in love with. Yeah. And that's a good lesson to learn. You know, I've got yeah. some friends who are really quite type A about it has to be... They have to be this, 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 and this. Yeah. And I... I think I was quite, I was more open to not, yeah, to being surprised. Yeah, that's so lovely. There was another love I wanted to ask you about because this one has not been my ideal. This is like love of body. Mm. I was just trying to be a brain in my 20s. I really wanted to have a certain job and I didn't pay any attention to how I felt to the point where I became really unwell. Yeah. And then I became very unwell in a different way because I got cancer and then it was like nine abdominal surgeries later. I felt like I was supposed to be very grateful to be alive, that I couldn't possibly 
want a nice shirt or want to care about how I look or wouldn't that make me a bad person? (laughs) And I, the way that you write about trying to create a loving relationship with your body is, Mm. I mean, the very intense way, relatable. And it's also just that it sounds so loving to me, that push pull where sometimes we can only love parts of who we are. Yeah. And then we're tolerating the rest, trying what they call it body neutrality, where they're just trying yeah. to work their way into better language. But I I've just I found your description of that push pull really Thank real. you. Real. It's been like such a long, long relationship. I'm kind of obsessed with bodies, I think. <laughs> I think I'm I'm obsessed with my body. I'm obsessed with other people's bodies. I've always been like that since I was a child. I'm obsessed with what we do with our bodies. I'm obsessed with what's expected of people at certain ages or of certain weights or certain whatever. And also I think I'm interested in this fact that this is our vehicle to experience the world. And it's yes. the only one that we get. But it's like it's, this you're talking about being beloved to yourself. It's so it's so sacred this thing it's so magical this incredible vessel that is going to be the thing that allows me to yeah. love and and fight and yeah. like yeah smell and get to know someone and and see culture and opera and it it should be nothing but loving that relationship actually and it and it never is it's very rare that it is or it takes you such a long time to get there it does i could talk about bodies yeah forever but interesting interestingly i'm so interested in what you said about how your relationship changed and how there was a conversation about what your relationship would be with your body after history and illness because most recent things that i think has really helped with this ongoing healing that i'm doing for the rest of my life of learning to be like respectful and loving to this vessel is one of my best friends had Uh, nearly died uh, last year because she had um it it was she it was post uh birth she um had always suffered from Crohn's her whole life and Crohn's was like hidden she had a flare-up in pregnancy which is hidden because it mirrors pregnancy symptoms and obviously like there is never enough understanding of women's bodies and medicine and how and anyway she she had uh, surgery and she had a stoma that was fitted and life-changing and she I remember the first time she came for dinner at mine in the first month she was so grateful just to be alive and to have be able to look after her baby and to be sat with me in my kitchen and then afterwards she said to me I wish I could give you this feeling she said I wish you could have this feeling about your body and not go through everything I've just gone through because I just feel I just feel so like I just love this thing and I just want every woman to feel this I love that answer. I love that answer. We're going to take a quick break to tell you about the sponsors of this show. We'll be right back. Your Farley love is so um, beautiful to me and being part of her family was so important Mm. and living through her lives and losses was so formative. Farley lost her sister so early and then you were there with her through that Mm. massive, irreparable life change. I wonder if the love and loss is so close together in your mind that Mm. like you just kind of understood early on how low, how costly love can be. It's that's an amazing question the way that you have phrased that. I think they live so close together for me. I have an F um tattooed on my wrist and it is for Farley, but I I I think I also got it for Florence as well, which who's the name of her sister. It's 10 years since she died uh hmm. this year. I mean, here's the thing. I I've lived a very blessed life. I I've, I've had very little um serious trauma and i feel i feel very very lucky for that i was 25 26 when florence got ill uh farley was a similar age florence was 19 Mm. farley and i at that point had already been best friends for 15 years and you know i'd grown up with florence i remember Mm. i had decided to go freelance for the first time and it totally coincided with florence going into hospital 
and the hospital was on Tottenham Court Road, which was a 20-minute bus from my house in Camden. And I remember thinking, and this is probably why I got my God hungriness, I remember thinking, like, oh, this was always the plan. I was always meant to have this time where I wasn't in an office, even, even though I wasn't ready to go freelance and I was, I was really struggling with making it work. It was someone was looking down on me because it meant she was signed off work because Florence was so sick she needed to be in the hospital every day and I would just get on a bus and go to this hospital every day and I it definitely felt like when when you have shared memories that relate to death particularly child death which is what Florence was even though she officially wasn't you know Farley and I have seen stuff together and we've had conversations that I, I can't even be begin to describe how horrifying the, that stuff is that we shared. Horrifying in how deeply sad it was. Yes. Goes and, into an impossible place. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And sometimes we talk about it and sometimes we don't. I think that has added a, a sense of preciousness to our bond. I think it's added a sense of of uh, understanding the fragility of things. I think that it's given us a huge depth of feeling for each other and understanding of each other. We were always close and she, we always will be close uh, in a way that I think some people maybe kind of don't understand particularly because we're so different. But I think you're totally right, long-winded way, I'm just kind of thinking aloud. I think that something about us going through that so, well, her going through that when she was so young and me being privy to that it's something I'll never be able to replicate with any other person, I think. Yeah. Yes. You know, yeah. That just reminded me, the word, the witness. Mm. One of the words comes from the Greek word of um, both like to see, mm. but also to co-suffer. Mm. To have like, to really be there. Yeah. And to, to live the cost with somebody. Yeah. I remember at one point, I've actually never told Farley this. She won't mind me saying it on a podcast. She's a very open person. I remember after Florence died, it was in December, right before Christmas. And I went to the house, the family house the next day. And then I was there for the week of the, before the funeral. And um, I kind of, I, I stayed with her. And I remember it was very heavy, but it was a total honor and I wouldn't have wanted to be anywhere else but you know for someone who's had a very charmed life this was big stuff to you know Farley's dad I remember he, understandably his daughter had just died I remember seeing him like cry I like saw him cry I went I went into the house the day afterwards and he just crumbled into my arms I hadn't had a man a middle-aged man cry in my arms before it was like a lot to process and I remember saying to my mum I did have plans for New Year's Eve and it just didn't feel right that I should go. And I said, do you think I should go be with Farley's family? And she said, you absolutely should be. You should offer that. And I remember saying to mum, I don't know if I can do it. Like, I don't... It feels so big to be with this grieving family who've just lost their child. And I feel so ill-equipped for it. And I remember my mum saying, this is the unwritten vow of friendship. This is the, this is the sickness and health. This is the better, the worse. Like, it's not just you and Folly giggling at home when we were teenagers. It's not just going to parties. It, she will do this for you, and, the, and, the, and it doesn't matter whether you feel equipped or not. It doesn't matter if you feel uncomfortable. It doesn't matter if you feel like you're going to fuck it up. This is the unsaid vow. You've got, you can't just take the fun stuff. You have to be there right now. Mm. <laughs> mm. I hope this is not weird. Uh, I was just going to give this to you after, but I got Florence's yearbook quote. I got it made into a print because I thought it was so lovely. And my lovely Chelsea was going through like a, one of those situations where I thought um, if she doesn't go through it in a certain way, it will break something in her and, I, and yeah. it will be hard to see. It will be so hard to see a thing that is let go. And so I, um, I read her that beautiful quote from Florence and then I got it made into a print. So oh, okay. I hope it's not. Um, anyway. Do you know something that brings me so much um, happiness is... Um, <laughs> One of the most quoted quotes on Goodreads for my books is, is Florence's Aww. yearbook page. In fact, I think it is the most quoted from everything I know about love. And all she wanted to do was be a writer. So Aww, it just lovey. means so much. It means so much to Aww. me. 
<laughs> oh, I can't make, can you believe an 18 year old wrote this would you read it for yeah, me yeah of course rip open hearts with your fury and tear down egos with your modesty be the person you wish you could be not the person you feel you're doomed to be let yourself run away with your feelings you were made so that someone could love you let them love you how can an 18 year old know to say that and she would have been nearly 30 now and I think all the time about what the work would have been that she would make you know and I th- I think and that's another thing that helps when I'm being like a whiny little bitch about people being mean about me on Twitter or whatever it is that I've found so difficult <laughs> um, and fucking ridiculous over the last few years which has come with this amazing career that I've had that I've been so lucky to have something that really helps with that is just thinking about the work that she wasn't allowed to make and the career she wasn't allowed to have. And I just so feel her with me all the time. Every time a huge career thing happens, I feel her punching the air. I went in, I remember going into the hospital and she couldn't speak at this point. I'd just been given my first column for the Sunday Times. I was, yeah, 26. And and I remember going in and finally saying, Dolly's just got this amazing news. She's going to be writing a column for the Sunday Times. And she couldn't speak, but she just like pun- punched the air with her fists. And I see yeah, how really it's, um, it's like such a trite thing to say, but it is always the most obvious things that are the most wise, isn't it? I just, I, I, whenever I'm feeling whingy about work stuff in particular, I just think I get to, I get to do it. You know, how lucky are we? Mm. <laughs> this is so beautiful. Thank oh. you. I think it's really beautiful that the person who then like keeps teaching through you keeps teaching in her own words yeah. and through you there's that lovely bell it's a bell hooks quote that i'll ruin but it's it's the feeling that there is no safety in love mm. there's, there's there love is so many things but yeah. it is not safe yeah and, like, so true so when she said let your let yourself run away with your feelings yeah. like let them because you're gonna be changed every time and then the idea that we can just keep changing every time someone loves us yeah. sounds like the the most hopeful thing. Yeah. Dolly, I like you so very much. It's embarrassing and I'm kind of sweaty about it. So. <laughs> this has been a beautiful conversation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. It's also just worth saying that it's very hard to nurture friendships, especially into adulthood. I really like that joke that goes, no one tells you that the greatest miracle is that Jesus had 12 close friends in his 30s. (laughs) It's it's pretty good. I mean, some of us are dripping with children and caregiving responsibilities for parents and people in our lives. And some people have so many responsibilities, responsible responsibilities is their middle name that really just keeps them from fun activities that maybe they used to enjoy. Sometimes we just get buried in our email inbox again and again, and then people just stop inviting us. We used to love to host. Maybe we used to love to have coffee dates or regular catch-ups over FaceTime, but we haven't done it in a long time. So if that's you, and if you've listened to this conversation in which that you had a little more room for friendship in your life, Maybe now is a good time to begin. Is there a book club you've been hoping to join? Maybe you could just say a friendly hi to a person down the hall or in a cubicle across the way. Maybe you want to take a note out of Dolly's book and reach out to that old friend you haven't caught up with in years to revive that eternal girlhood we all have inside of us. Florence has wisdom for us all. Like she said, You were made so that someone could love you. Let them love you. Because how lucky are we? We get to do this. Bear witness to the lives of our friends and invite them to bear witness to ours. Every beautiful, terrible moment of it. It's better together, isn't it? I sure think so. All right, your turn. Did your bestie make a conjunctivitis scavenger hunt? I want to hear your weird friendship stories. Write me a note on social media. I'm at Kate C. Bowler. Or leave us a voicemail at 
888-888-8731. And before you go, could you leave us a review on Apple or Spotify? Oh, I know I'm using my school teacher voice, but I would love it. I would love it so much. It really helps people find the show. And a big thank you to my team and our partners for all the work they put into this episode. Lily Endowment, the Duke Endowment, and Duke Divinity School are our champions all the time. This podcast is really my favorite thing that I get to do with other people. All my love goes to Jess Ritchie, Harriet Putman, Keith Weston, Baze Hohen, Gwen Hickenbotham, Brenda Thompson, Iris Green, Haley Durrett, Anne Herring, Hope Anderson, Kristen Bowser, Elias Zanio, and Catherine Smith. You are my everything. I'll talk to you next week, my loves. This is Everything Happens with me, Kate Bowler. <laughs>